In America, 80% of all people have a sibling, whether it's a brother or sister. A sibling is a special bond, a friend or possibly a rival who will be with you all your life. But as close and special as a sibling can be, there is something that goes further than just being a regular sibling, and that is a twin. Twins account for 1.5% of all pregnancies and about 3% of the world's population. Most siblings have an age gap that separates them, but with a twin, it is your biological duplicate, someone who is there with you from the start, a companion for life. So it's not uncommon that twins will develop similar interests, follow the same passions and careers. So what if I told you a story about two identical twin brothers who were born on November 8, 1974? These two brothers grew up drawing anime characters that they would watch on TV like Ariel from Dr. Slump and Doraemon. They both grew up watching Kikunuman, in the original Dragon Ball anime, and they both idolized Dragon Ball's creator Akira Toriyama, and would go on to eventually try and become professional manga artists, as well, who could see their work serialized. One of these brothers you know very well. He's famous, an influential creator whose work is one of the best-selling comics of all time with over 250 million volumes sold. It has multiple anime series that have lasted over 20 years, and its spin-off continues to this day. A franchise that has spanned across a dozen movies and even spawned theme parks and has made countless fans across the world. A man whose work has created a media juggernaut that has lasted for generations and still manages to attract new fans even to this day. That man I'm talking about is of course Naruto creator Masashi Kishimoto, but we're not here to talk about the astronomical amount of success seen by Masashi Kishimoto. What we are here to talk about is his identical twin brother, Seshi Kishimoto, how despite dwelling in the shadow of a giant, he has still managed to push forward, making his own work, trying to carve out a path of his own with his own manga. This is his story. Seshi's big break into the world of manga followed a few years after his older twin brother debuted in Naruto and Shonen Jump back in 1999. His first serialization was a little something called Satan 666, whereas it's translated into other God-fearing parts of the world, O Parts Hunter. The basic premise is pretty bare bones. Got a young kid named Geo Freed who's a treasure hunter seeking out mysterious artifacts left behind by an advanced civilization called O Parts. Oh, and he's also serving as the vessel for Satan. Hmm. Precocious young boy harboring a destructive demonic evil spirit. Where have I heard of that one before? Sounds kind of familiar. Oh yeah! So as you can imagine, Seshi got a lot of shit and criticism for liberally borrowing some elements from his more successful twin brother's mega hit series. We got a sort of edgy protagonist who was ostracized because of having something big and evil inside him, but overcomes it through the power of friendship. We got a mentor figure that kind of resembles another mentor figure most of you might recognize. Oh hey, there's also an early level evil gangster guy who resembles another early arc evil gangster guy uh, from Naruto. Even the low level villain designs feel like Naruto filler character designs, but instead of wanting to be the Hokage, Geo, being the little edgelord that he is, wants to rule the world. Many cries of plagiarism were thrown at Seshi, and it even got so bad his twin brother Masashi had to step in and beg people to stop calling his twin brother a copycat, arguing that they had similar styles having grown up watching similar things. While I'd say that both series have the same roots of appreciation towards the golden age of Toriyama, with of course Satan 666 taking heavy inspiration by having its two central leads be sort of an analog homages to the original Goku Bulma dynamic, what separated 666 from Naruto was its use of Judeo Christian mythology as opposed to the liberal sprinkling of Buddhist mythology that was littered across Naruto. But this wasn't enough for the series to build any kind of traction. It was never picked up for an anime and eventually saw its close. Satan 666 is probably the closest thing Seshi ever saw to a major success, and as of today, it is his longest running work, seeing how it lasted from 2001 all the way to 2007, spawning 19 manga volumes. But in the face of his twin brother's unrelenting juggernaut, it never managed to really reach the same level of success. I'm still amazed I can even find images of Satan 666 cosplayers, but there's a small speck of a fan culture, but it never grew into anything greater. His next series kicked off a year later after Satan 666 wrapped up with a new serialization called Blazer Drive. Blazer Drive. This was Seshi's attempt to try and create a toy manga similar to something like Beyblade or Yu-Gi-Oh. And to his credit, he came up with one of the most seemingly cynical merchandisable concepts I've ever seen. For you see, Blazer Drive focused on a futuristic world where people would gain superpowers by attaching stickers to themselves. On one hand, I sort of respect the pure cynicism at play to try and create something that felt so blatantly commercial. You could practically feel the video game and toy spinoffs begging to be made for it as kids across the world would run around buying out Blazer Drivers sticker packs from Toys R Us. 
but the series never caught on and didn't even manage to last as long as Satan 666, lasting only about two years and getting cancelled before it could hit chapter 40. But it did get a DS game, which is, I guess, better than anything Satan 666 got. After trying to make blatant commercial shonen hits, this is where we see the shift in Seshi's storytelling sensibilities. Going the conventional Dragon Ball route just wasn't working. It was time to tap into all of that anger and resentment of being the lesser twin, the unsuccessful one, and channel it into his work. It was time to start pulling out edgier, darker material, and his first foray into the depths of edginess came in the form of, oh Jesus Christ, let's see if I can manage to not butcher the pronunciation of this one. Kurene no Ukami to Ashikasi no Hitsuju or The Crimson Wolf and the Fetters of the Sheep. Ugh, where I even go about explaining this one? So it's like a edgy anime version of Little Red Riding Hood where wolves are like monsters that represent a person's inner thoughts and desires, but the sheep self is their superficial fake self. So like a monster Red Riding Hood girl has to hunt down evil monster wolf people hiding their sheep forms, but she needs her own sheep who's like the boring protagonist kun It's a sort of supernatural monster of the week setup with an overly convoluted mythology and a lot of art that feels like it's trying really, really hard to be edgy and provocative and feels reminiscent of something you'd see in Helsing. Well, I'll remember that cheap boy because you're going to see a new version of him later. So this series didn't even last as long as Blazer Drive and was quickly cancelled and has largely been forgotten. But Seshi was in full edgelord mode. He wanted to make sure no one would ever call him a copycat ever again. So he proceeded to leave the shonen genre behind and pursue making seinen manga. His next serialization came in the form of Sukadachi 9, where, well, get a load of this. In the grim, dark future where Japan's population grows smaller and smaller, the murder rate skyrockets. In response, the Japanese government implements stricter laws against the worst criminals. In this new dark future, even the death penalty isn't enough to deter the most violent crimes. In the midst of this crisis, Japan brings back the 19th century revenge law, where victims employ a special government agency to capture murderers and enact the same methods that were used on their victims to kill them. These are the sisters bringing justice to the families of the wrong. These are the Sukadachi Nine. So yeah, you got all these guys wearing badass red armor that looks like it came from Akira. But basically what they do is they execute death row inmates by killing them through the same method that they used on the victim, as the relatives watch through VR goggles. It's the kind of idea that feels like it's trying to be a morally complex tale about vengeance and the meaning of justice, seeing how all the Sukadachi 9 members have suffered from some form of tragedy in the past, motivating them to take on their work. But it's just kind of a dumb idea. It's unnecessarily complicated form of death penalty where it's a battle manga set up where the sister battles the murderer in an abandoned cityscape. It feels like a lethal injection would be a lot easier versus the weird kind of gladiatorial combat where someone with a power suit uses the incredible power of empathy to burn someone alive or transplant their organs in an operation. It's not a very exciting setup to build a scene in battle manga around, even if the uniforms do look kind of neat. It feels unnecessary and overly complicated to have a battle force of people who basically just perform overly convoluted executions just so the bereaved can enjoy some VR snuff porn. It was the kind of setup that sounds badass and cool and meaningful on paper, but the more you think about the logistics of it, it just really feels kind of stupid. As you can imagine, the series didn't last much longer than his other works. After two years, it was canceled, but Seshi wasn't going to back down. He was going to go full throttle to make his masterpiece. Freed from the constraints of petty shonen morality, he was going to produce his magnum opus, a balls-to-the-wall series with all the sex and violence he could muster, and that beautiful strange beast was Mad Chimera World. Seshi managed to craft the ultimate MRA MGTOW apocalyptic fantasy. In a barren and desolate future where mankind no longer exists, the world is overrun by chimera and mutant women, superpowered animal women who hunger for one thing, men. In this dystopian future where feminism has finally run amok, the men must hide as they are hunted by the women to be used for food, pleasure, and procreation. Two siblings must traverse this wasteland of estrogen as they search for the truth and the secret of the Mad Chimera World. Now, I don't think I'd ever call Mad Chimera World good, but it's probably the most interesting thing Seshi has done. It's like he just said, fuck it, and let his id run wild as he drew as many provocative animal monster girls as he could imagine, letting all the weird sex and violence imagery in his mind run rampant. I mean, there's a scene where the main bunny girl masturbates to create an anti-woman perfume for her brother to use. An Afro-man robot who screws his pelvis into the giant robot rhino to become his living robo-penis. 
A woman who lays a bunch of eggs in the desert then gets kicked in the gut in the middle of a battle and pops out some more eggs. Oh hey, there's another sheep boy, like the one from the last manga. Guess Seshi really, really likes drawing sheep boys with big horns. All this madness and so much more are what you'll find in the kaleidoscopic funhouse of sex and violence that constitutes Mad Chimera World. I wouldn't call any of it good, but at the same time, I appreciate the heavy metal go for broke aesthetic of just being violent and sexual as possible without any kind of apologies in an attempt to go as far from the wheelhouse of anything that would be associated with your brother's work. But while Seshi has never seen the level of success as Kishi, there's something remarkable I find in his work. A big appeal of Naruto was the reason why it found such a huge worldwide audience was because it was an underdog story, personified by the titular main character who kind of sucked but strove towards the path of not sucking, although I think the underdog message of Naruto was best personified in the tale of Rock Lee. Rock Lee didn't have the innate talent of his peers or the genius who was on his team. There was only one thing Rock Lee could do. He trained, pledging to become the genius of hard work, fighting against his limitations day and night as he tried to surpass his limits. The irony of Kishimoto is that despite the fact he identified with the underdog characters like Rock Lee and Naruto himself, he became the opposite, a living vision of Naruto's rival Sasuke, the genius who took the world by storm to become one of the most successful creators in the medium. A titan whose work is still being enjoyed and rediscovered by new generations to this very day. In some ways, you can see this reflected in the later arcs of Naruto. Naruto towards the end wasn't the screw-up. Through the retcon, he became the son of the fourth Hokage. Then later, he became the reincarnation of Asura Utsuki, the son of the god of all ninja. He changed from a screw-up child who was looked down upon into the literal prodigy ninja Jesus from one of the greatest lineages in his universe. Just like how Kishi went from an underdog failing student to a multi-millionaire mangeka worth over $20 million. But all the while his brother strove on, continuing to work at his craft, experimenting, challenging himself, trying to find his voice. While Masashi became a god, Seshi continued to work alone, like Rock Lee hitting that leg post late into the night, truly embodying the spirit of one of Kishi's greatest creations, and that is something I can appreciate. Someone who has tasted from the bitter cup of failure but continues to move forward continues to go through the creative desert looking for the oasis of inspiration. I think the funniest thing in all this was the fact that Masashi recently came back to the world of manga with a new series called Samurai 8. It was pushed really hard by the editorial board of Shonen Jump, and despite it being a new series from the mega successful creator of Naruto, Samurai 8 never managed to gain a fan base. Getting abysmally low sales for its volume releases, it continued to struggle in the magazine's rankings, and recently it was canceled before it even celebrated a year of publication. Masashi was forced to taste from the same bitter cup of failure as his twin brother, and the funny thing is, is that Kishimoto didn't even draw Samurai 8. One of his former assistants did, while he handled the story. So maybe the two twins aren't so different after all. Now they've both tasted the bitter cup of failure, but one Kishimoto still draws moving forward while the other does not. It's funny, in one of his earlier volumes of Naruto, Masashi related a story he was told by his parents that when he and his brother were still babies, his parents put several toys and objects in front of them to see which they would naturally attract them to determine their later interests in life. There was a paintbrush, some toy cars, and money. Baby Seshi took a great amount of time considering carefully which one he'd choose, and then eventually he went for the paintbrush. Well, baby Masashi, he went for the money. And thus their paths were set, but in the twilight years, Seshi is still holding onto that paintbrush even as Mad Chimera World was canceled, he's still moving forward, inhabiting the spirit of Rock Lee, alone in that forest, kicking the post, hoping one day he can get better, and trying again and again. And in a way, I find that more remarkable, that image of perseverance, of pushing forward, even when your closest peer finds the success that you wish you could have for yourself. But while Masashi sacrificed his body for the art, Seshi could continue to move forward, chasing the next inspiration, and someday, maybe, just maybe, he'll find that success. So thank you so much for watching this video. And for all of you watching, just remember, whatever your dreams and ambitions may be, whatever your goals in life are, just be thankful that you don't have a twin sibling who did what you wanted to do far more effectively to the point where the United States government needed to brief about what the Naruto run is. Because at the very least, you don't have that level of depression that poor Seshi Kishimoto does, where people literally run like the characters his twin brother made, ironically and unironically, across the world. But if Seshi can live with that, then you can keep on pursuing anything that you want to. I would like to take a moment, like I do in most of my videos, to thank my patrons. Like Seshi Kishimoto, I am on an uphill journey trying to climb this YouTube ladder. 
struggling against an algorithm that is constantly pushing me down. But these are the people who give me the financial fortitude to keep climbing that ladder, to pursue that greatness of eventually finding my place where I can do this full time. So thank you, Joseph Malti, Carla Hoffman, Aaron Tony, Walking the Steps, Walter Street, and most recently, thank you for joining the Lobster Pot, the ultimate jabroni, Jabari. Thank you so much for being a part of the Lobster Pot. Thank you so much for supporting my efforts. If you want to join them, you're more than welcome to join the Lobster Pot. Take a look at my videos early, behind the scenes stuff. And thank you so much for watching this video. And remember, lobsters and tennis, but don't you grab it.